Welcome to the Children's Ministry Web Summit brought to you by PajamaConference.com and David C. Cook. I am Dr. Andy Johnson and I am excited to share with you today about change in ministry, something that we probably all struggle with at some point in our ministry. Um, I am a children's pastor. I am a children's pastor at Ingleside Baptist Church in Macon, Georgia. I have been doing that for about a year and a half at that church and was previously in North Carolina with a church there. I have a Master of Divinity and a Doctor of Education, so I love um, studying discipleship. I love um, studying how people learn and grow. Uh, I love studying ministry and ministry leadership as well. Um, <clears throat> really excited that um, we get to share some of that today together. Uh, I'm a husband. <clears throat> I'm a dad. I've got two little girls, and uh, we are adopting a little boy from Bulgaria, so we have a little boy on the way that's going to join our family soon. Looking forward to that, and I uh, enjoy riding, I enjoy running, so um, I will tell you a little bit more about some of my writing later on. I used to uh, be the author of a blog called Free CM Stuff, and all of that content is now at um, the International Network of Children's Ministry, incm.org, and it's also over at kidology.org. So I didn't waste that site. That content's still out there. And I'll tell you about a new site that I uh, have been excited about as well. Making effective change is an art form. <laughs> I mean, just consider individual changes you make in your life. You can get on those changes. Sometimes you can become your own worst enemy. I mean, take exercise, for example. You get really excited about it. You get going on it. Then you lose self-control. You lose discipline. You become your own worst enemy. Now, add multiple layers to that. Add ministry teams. Add pastors. Add staff. Add a whole congregation. And the levels of complexity just really grow, making effective change and innovation very difficult. So changes can be really good, but they Daddy, can be I'm rotten hungry. as well. Um, Daddy, Daddy, I'm hungry. Take my surroundings, for ex example. Um, you know, I haven't really thought through uh, the fact that you all might be distracted Daddy, by Daddy, children. Okay, by children being here, there's noise in the background. It's like I'm I didn't even. Daddy. Okay, I understand that. It's like I didn't even care about how this is going to affect your view or what it looks like. I mean, there's so many distractions. Change can just be terrible, but your changes, they don't have to be this way. That's what the next 45 minutes is about. We're going to start with scripture, we're going to look at Nehemiah, and then we are going to uh, delve into the nature of change and look at six non-negotiable factors for effective innovation. And there'll be some opportunity for you uh, to look into a situation that you might be changing or thinking of changing right now. Okay, so here we are, back to the beginning. Um, you know, maybe this is just a lesson that sometimes change is maybe not the best thing. You might go through some processes of thinking through a way something could be different, and you determine, nope, we should have done it the way that we were doing it to begin with. So here I am, got a good place in the house, there's no kids to bug me, uh, there's no treadmills to run on, there's no banging going on outside, got a good quiet place, let's buckle down, talk about some change. The point of this workshop is for us to, to understand the change process and to learn skills which will help you lead an effective change in your ministry. And that's what we really want, is for you to be able to lead an effective change. And <clears throat> so let's go to uh, Jeremiah, uh, excuse me, Nehemiah, and go look at the scriptures for a moment. We're going to be in Nehemiah chapter 2, and we'll look at verses 11 through 20. So if you've got your Bible, your iPad, why don't you open that up right now? I'll give you a second to do that. Okay, so Nehemiah chapter 2, we know the story. Nehemiah finds out that the walls of his city have been crumbled down. His city is unfortified. He'd never lived there. He asked the king for help. The king granted him help, said, yes, go here, rebuild your city. And so Nehemiah gets to the city, and that's where we come to on Nehemiah 2.11. Here's what he says. So I came to Jerusalem and was there for three days. And I rose in the night, and I and a few men with me. 
I did not tell anyone what my God was putting into my mind to do for Jerusalem, and there was no animal with me except the animal on which I was riding. So I went out at night by the valley gate in the direction of the dragon's well and on to the refuse gate, inspecting the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down and its gates consumed by fire. Then I passed on to the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was no place for my mount to pass. So I went up at night by the ravine and inspected the wall. Then I entered the valley gate again and returned. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I had done, nor had I as yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or the rest who did the work. Then I said to them, you see the bad situation we are in, that Jerusalem is desolate and its gates burned by fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem so that we will no longer be a reproach. I told them how the hand of my God had been favorable to me and also about the king's words which we, he had spoken to me. Then they said, Let us arise and build. So they put their hands to the good work. But when Sambalot the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard it, they mocked us and despised us, and said, What is this thing you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? And so I answered them and said to them, The God of heaven will give us success. Therefore we his servants will arise and build, but you have no portion, right, or memorial in Jerusalem. So good word of God just to talk to us about change. Um, and we can learn a lot from what Nehemiah was going through. You know, some questions we think about, what was the change that was needed uh, that Nehemiah saw in the story? Well, he saw that his city was unfortified. He saw that uh, his city needed to go from being a weak to an unfortified uh to a, a strong and fortified city and a protected people. What was Nehemiah's very first step in leading out this change? He didn't hearken it from the rooftops. He didn't go out and get people to sign a petition. He didn't have some back hallway conversations with some of the uh, political people in Jerusalem. No, he went out and he evaluated the situation. He looked at every possible angle angle of what was going on wrong and what needed to be changed. So Nehemiah then addressed the people. He realized, I've got to convey this vision. And in verse 17 and 18, we see from him what his strong points were in sharing this vision. He adequately described the need for change. He said that our city uh, has been burned down. He proclaimed a vision for future results. Let us not be a reproach to the other peoples in the land. He tied this vision in personally. You don't want to be a reproach. We want to honor God with this. And he spoke of success of God's leading, spoke of how the king, how God had used the king to get him to that point. He expressed the vision. Nehemiah got some resistance. We know throughout the book that Sinbalat and Tobiah were his enemies. They at one point said, look at that wall. How could a, a fox jumping on that thing would even tear that wall down? And uh, how did he, you're going to get resistance when you uh, try to change something. How did he approach that resistance? Well, he kept God at the center. He uh, knew that God was the one that was going to make things happen. And he said to some others, look, if you don't like this, you don't have to be a part of this to those non-Jews. And so I think we've got a great lesson there from Nehemiah that we can really learn about how effective change needs to be made. Well, let's take a look and shift gears and look at the nature of change. I want to uh, look at six different elements of change that help us to understand change a little bit better. First of all, and the first thing is that change is natural. Seasons change, our time moves on, uh, the, there will be a new creation one day in heaven, styles change, ideas and philosophies change. If you look at the book of Hebrews, you will notice how uh, that is focused on there was an old way and an old guard and an old um, shadow of things and new things have come. There was an old temple and now you are the new temple. There was an old priest and now Christ is our priest. There was an old sacrifice and now Christ is the one sacrifice and mediator between us and God. So change is natural. It happens. The problem comes when people don't want to accept 
that change is natural, that things have to be done differently sometimes. Secondly, change is inevitable. Resistance to change is futile. It is going to happen. When you recognize and get your people to recognize that change is inevitable, it helps us to be prepared for those changes. It helps your people not to be stuck in the status quo. That means you need to watch traditions very carefully. I'm not opposed to a tradition. Tradition is a wonderful thing to have some certain things that you do and people look forward to year after year. But you need to be careful with traditions. Being careful with traditions helps people to see that change is inevitable. We're not going to stick with this for all of eternity. We will have a different color carpet in our kids' ministry floor eventually. Things like that. Another third thing is that change is necessary. And so the quote here would be, change or die. Change is necessary. The uh, former U.S. Army Staff Sergeant uh, Eric uh, Shinseld, he said, if you don't like change, you're going to like irrelevance even less. If you don't like change, you're going to like irrelevance even less less. If you want to minister within the culture that you're in, within the times that we're in, you have to change some things. Churches that operate in the 1950s mentality are dying. They're not growing. The churches that want to innovate, that want to reach people where they are, that want to be relevant, those are the churches uh, that are growing. And most, I will say most because I want to guard this with theology and ensuring that we don't change a, a biblical theology, but most practices, most methodologies, most curriculums, most programs, they have a shelf life. Change is necessary. Those things simply will not serve your purposes for a long, long amount of time in most cases. Fourth thing to understand about change is that change is a process. Change is something that needs to be massaged. It's something that needs to be well thought out. Effective change is composed of several identifiable steps which we'll walk through towards the end. It's a process. Fifth thing about change is that it is value-based. All changes are based on, or, or lack of change, is based on some type of belief system or value system. Nehemiah believed that God called his people to be strong. Nehemiah believed that God was a God of protection, and so he was used by God to go and help fortify that city, Jerusalem. And the sixth and final thing, that change, this is probably the most important thing, is people-oriented. It can be very difficult for many people who are stuck in a rut or are used to a tradition or want to do it a certain way. Change is people-oriented. The minority of, uh, can often be loud and discouraging, a handful of people in the midst of change. You've got to understand that those folks do have something going on in their head with their feelings or their motivations. People's commitments are tied into change, something they have spent a lot of time doing or building or been a part of, and you pull that away can often bring pain and emotion for those people. We have to work through those people issues. When done right, though, change really bolsters a leader's reputation. Uh, because it's people-centered, when you do a change effectively, they build trust in you. And as that trust builds, change becomes more and more easy. It sort of becomes the silent, I told you so. <laughs> you know, it's, I got this done, and we did it well, and it was for the better, and the people see that, and it's the silent, I told you so. We trust him now. When tied into the church's purpose and vision, change can be very unifying and engaging and, and build lots of momentum within your church, another people-oriented element. And finally, because change is so people-oriented, People are your greatest asset when initiating change. Getting people on board, getting them on your team, getting them to be outspoken, uh, outspoken folks for the change that's going on, that is such a crucial thing. That's why change is so people-centered. All right, so let's talk about 10 barriers to effective change or innovation. First one, negative voices. You're going to find that people will speak very loudly. They will carry their voice as one that is representative of the whole, and it probably is not. They will use things like, all these people are saying, 
or everyone is concerned about and those are folks that you need to ensure that you work with and speak to and do not ostracize but you also need to be careful that you take seriously the ones who have uh, the ability to influence others and maybe not take as seriously the ones who don't have the ability to influence others. <clears throat> A second thing is uh, barrier to effective change is thinking somebody else is going to do it. You see a need and you see it needs to be done. You think, well, somebody else will take care of that. Well, that's not my responsibility. Well, maybe it is your responsibility as a team player, or maybe you think that a volunteer is going to handle that and it just doesn't happen. That can definitely be a barrier. Number three, no culture of change. Have things just simply been done that way before for a long time? And if there's not a culture of change in your place, that's going to make your first couple of changes <clears throat> very difficult. But after that, things get better. Number four is not knowing the history uh, of previous changes or not knowing the history of why a certain thing was done a certain way. You don't know that. You don't know how people have possibly been hurt in the past, and that can really damage you. The history itself can even be damaging. The fact that something has been done a certain way uh, could very much limit what you're able to do in a change or how quickly that change may be able to take place. Number five barrier to change would be a um, <clears throat> lack of resources. You think, well, we don't have the money, the finances to do this. There's lots of creative ways to make changes happen. I want to encourage you to not get discouraged that there could be a lack of resources within your budget, your church. And I want you to just ask God for his favor and ask God to make the provision. That's what Nehemiah did. He relied on God to use the king and he relied on God to provide the right people. He trusted in the Lord to take care of the vision that Lord had given him. Sixth thing would be forgetting your vision and purpose. If you don't know what your church is all about, you don't have a discipleship process in place, it's going to be really difficult to make changes. Um, number seven would be a short amount of time, and that would probably be equated to poor planning. If you have a short amount of time to get a change done, you are not going to be able to follow through with all of the steps that need to be taken in order to, to massage this change. And if you plan poorly, you don't allow yourself that amount of time, then that's really your fault, not anybody else's. Eighth thing would be one-person leadership. If uh, you take the role of a dictator in change instead of building consensus and raising up a team to help you, you're going to find a lot of difficulty, and that's definitely a barrier. Then the ninth thing would be um, you don't have the relationships. Perhaps you haven't been there long enough or you haven't invested in people in a sense where they realize that you care for them and you care for the good of the people that you're working with and the good of the ministry. If you don't have those relationships, it's going to be very difficult to, to make a change. That's why I think that in, in smaller churches, if you make a change uh, inside your one-year window, a major change, it's going to find a lot of difficulty. In larger churches where you really get to know a lot of folks, if you make a major change within about a year and a half, you're probably going to find some difficulty in that as well. You've got to build those relationships, and that takes time. The tenth barrier to change I would see is not willing to take a risk. Maybe you see that there's a need for something to be different, and you just think, well, I'm just satisfied with status quo. I'm just satisfied with things just the way they are. I'm just going to let them be that way. And if you're not willing to take a risk, then you're never going to initiate the change process in the first place. So let's take a, um, about one minute here, and I want you to write out one major thing that needs changing in your ministry. So write that, and I want you to take a, another step after you've written that. After these 10, thinking through these 10 barriers that I've listed, what are the major barriers to that change happening? One change, what are the major barriers? And we'll come back in just a moment.
Okay, so we're back. You've gotten your one change that you're going to make. Perhaps it's a curriculum change. Perhaps it is a major change in a volunteer process or, or, or uh, responsibility. Perhaps it is a shift in staffing. Perhaps it is something with your facility. You got that change and you've written down what some barriers are. Let's walk through six major steps of making a change, an effective change in your ministry so that you can serve the Lord through this change. The first step would be evaluation. We saw that with Nehemiah, right? He walked around, he evaluated the situation, he looked at what particular things were going wrong, he looked at what needed rebuilding, he, he evaluated the level of rebuilding there. When you evaluate a change, you need to spend time in prayer, asking the Lord for guidance, going to the Proverbs and looking how Solomon talks to us about working with others and leading others and what our attitude and level of humility ought to be. Praying, studying your, your scriptures, but also studying the situation. Looking at what other churches have done, finding out how that problem or that change has been made effectively in other scenarios. Networking with people, and, and you can really dig and find out about how they've done change through networking. Informal interviews, just having a phone call, call up some churches that you know have, have, have larger ministries or you know have done a change that you've, you want to go through, find out how they did it. Find out what um, processes they used. Uh, find out what problems they came across. Find out what they would have done differently. Uh, evaluating is all part of that. You want to also determine between your symptoms and your underlying causes. If you want to change something, you've determined there's a problem here. So what are the symptoms versus what are the underlying causes of that problem? Symptoms may be that people are not growing the way that you think they should grow. It may be that the parents are getting frustrated with your check-in system. That would be a symptom of a, a faulty check-in system. Determine those symptoms, but then look deeper and find out what are the underlying causes about this. If parents are really frustrated about a check-in program, a check-in system that we have, then that's a symptom. The cause may be that it is simply too complex for them to work through. There's too many pieces for them with a, a baby and a baby carrier and dealing with a diaper bag and then they've got their fourth grader, they've got to get to the other side of the building. What are the causes behind that that need the change? The symptom does not need to be changed. The causes need to be changed. Some questions to ask during this evaluation time would be, why is the change needed? Who is involved in this? Who has buy-in or weigh-in to this? What are all the perspectives? How does, how does this person view it or this group view it? What kind of difference will it make? Count the cost. Will it make a minor difference that is just more of a preference for you? Or will this make a major difference that's going to really boost the level of your ministry? How does this fit into the church vision? Don't go and make a change in your area of ministry if this doesn't fit into the way your pastor and the rest of the staff are leading. Don't become a silo. Don't isolate yourself. You will only be seen as the enemy if you do that. How does it fit in the church vision? When should this change occur? Should I, should I try to get going on this now? Would it be better to wait till the fall when some other things are changing and things are new? Would that make it a little better? Would it be better to happen in the summer when our numbers drop and we can test run and trial this change? When should it occur? What would an appropriate timeline be? What kind of things do you need to do to get ready for that? Do I need to have a meeting with this person and this person? Do I need to make this certain presentation? Do I need to purchase these certain things before it happens? Create a timeline of when those things need to occur. Um, who should help lead this out? What people are involved? Who, who can I get on my team? And then finally, um, how will we know if it's working? We want to evaluate these things as well so that we know whether it's working, whether it's been effective, whether it was ridiculous, what people think about it, how people view it, come up with a way to evaluate that. The second non-negotiable factor would be teamwork. Like I said before, if you're going to isolate yourself, if you're going to be a dictator, you're not going to create effective change. You've got to have a team working with you. I would say that you need to build a team of qualified individuals. Now that does not mean that if you are changing your 
um, your entire uh, decor in your preschool hallway. And that might be a big change because right now they, they had somebody who uh, is 40 year old uh, Bertha who 10 years ago spent three weeks painting all of her murals on the walls, but it's just outdated, doesn't need to be there anymore. Well, let's get on that team of people who are going to help you carry that out. Yes, you need some people who are good with decorating. Yes, it'd be nice to have some construction oriented or, or painters. Uh, yes, it would be really nice to have some people who are invested in the preschool hallway and would be in there on a week to week basis. But what about some people who are good buds with Bertha? who can help work with her to say, listen, we appreciate what you've done. We're going we're gonna to take out a, one of the bricks and frame it or something and dedicate that to you and give that to you to put on your coffee table, whatever, uh, so that Bertha can still be honored. But you need to have qualified individuals on that team. And that doesn't mean that they are qualified specifically to help carry out that change, uh, but it might mean that they have some some external ways that they can assist with the change. This team that you're going to have, they will be able to diffuse arguments, they will be able to expand the conversation, they will be able to spur on enthusiasm and broadcast your vision to more people than just you. If you, just you is having the hallway conversations about that change, you're going to reach three, four people a week. If you have a team of five, six people, you're going to be reaching 20, 25 people every week with that vision, answering questions, communicating, that kind of thing. That team is really going to help you. I would suggest also bringing on a naysayer or two, someone who you think would, would possibly be against it uh, and could offer some good criticism and tell them that you welcome them on there because you you have a expand your or you want to explain your vision to them and you want them on there to help shape that. I recall a time when I was at my first church and I attempted to change our volunteer process in terms of background checks. This was a mess. I thought I had my pastor's support. I did have his support, but I didn't have the relationships built, and I got a lot of naysayers. I had a handful of people who really created a big stir and in doing background checks. I'd only been at this church for six months when I decided to do this, and uh, there was a bad history behind that, and there were people who felt like they were above that. They shouldn't have had to have that done because they had been serving there for 15, 20, 25 years. And so that went really wrong. Well, when we decided to come back to it about a year and a half later, I got a team together and I pulled on two of my key naysayers, the two that I had the most conversations with, the two that were the most frustrated, and the two with the loudest voices on this. We worked out a, a little bit of a compromise. I was still happy and satisfied with it. We changed a few things, but that's okay because the ultimate purpose of screening volunteers and creating a system where our children were safe, it happened and it was a good process. And on the letter that went out to all of these volunteers about this new process, the bottom of that letter was the signature of everybody on this team we had put together, including the two who had spoken out the loudest about it. And several months after that, we had every volunteer who had filled out their forms and become background checked. It was a great way for us to see how teams play into it. When it was just me shouting out, this is what we're going to do, didn't work well. When we got a team of people to help, really was effective change. The third thing you want to do that's non-negotiable, you've got to create a vision and strategy behind that vision. People need to see what you see. So if you see that it needs to be done a certain way and there are steps that you've got in your mind that need to take place, people need to be able to see that. It needs to be in writing. It needs to be uh, either in some sort of handout or mailer that communicates the steps, that communicates the why behind the process so that they can buy into your vision. They're going to need to see how that vision is beneficial. They need to understand that there are deep benefits in the ministry behind why you're doing what you're doing. So show them the how, the who's behind it, the what you're doing, the when. And remember, in all this, remember these evaluation questions that you're going to be asking because they're going to be based on how you lay out your strategy and vision.
Present detailed action steps and objectives for, uh, at the very least, your team and paint broader strokes for the people who will be affected by it on a more corporate level. And if the change is large, present that change in, in uh, the present phases and the manageable parts that you're going to accomplish uh, for that. The fourth thing I would suggest would be communication. Uh, you want to communicate this in as many ways as possible. Email, face-to-face uh, -face conversations, have an informational meeting about it, send home a mailer. Uh, you might uh, do a blog post on your church explaining these things. Uh, people are down on what they're not up on. And so if you are not clearly communicating what people need to know, they're going to be down on it and you've already defeated yourself. Uh, got a great quote from Leif Anderson. He says, when the decision to change has been made, it should be communicated throughout the organization to those affected by it. This requires frequent, redundant communications. Those to whom the ideas are new need sufficient time to process the proposed change. Most people need to hear, consider, react, interact, and accept before they buy into the change. It is not only unfair to expect others to agree in an hour to a decision that took a year, but it often results in initial rejection. Acceptance of new ideas takes time. And that's from great church leader Leith Anderson, a book he wrote called Dying for Change, uh, copyright 1990. So if you're interested in that book, I would highly recommend it. Communicate as much as possible. And I would say along the way, celebrate your small successes. Show how the various steps or phases have been accomplished and the fruit that they have brought. So I would make sure that you celebrate those small successes. Fifth step I would say is monitoring. This requires time, intentionality, and purpose. Monitor the steps that you have taken and evaluate uh, them. Formal and informal meetings will need to take place. Just having conversation um, and having a survey instrument will be extremely helpful. Uh, some sort of evaluation instrument, whether it's a to click one through five type of survey or a way for people to um, broadcast by typing the way they sense uh, a change is going. And when things don't go as planned, you need to make sure that you're evaluating that as well and make another change in the midst if need be. And then the sixth and final thing I would say is adapt your culture to change. Once that change has been made, you want to create a new normal. You want to create a, uh, a new status quo. Make the new way of doing things seem like the old way. Bring people to own the change through encouragement, through celebration of their successes, removing references to the old way, removing terminology to the old way, removing documents that referred or pictures or logos that referred to the old way. Get those out and usher the new way in so the new way is really the old way. The new way is the way we've always done it. And then you might be challenged for another change later on. This takes time, but it's naturally uh, becomes the lasting result of this change process being accomplished successfully. People embrace it, they accept it, they see that what you have changed is a good thing, and they accept it as their own. So I'll tell you what, why don't you take uh, another minute right now, and why don't you look at the one thing that you decided you wanted to change, and look at those barriers that you listed uh, on your your handout and now I want you to evaluate what you need to do to overcome those barriers. Let's take a minute to do that.
right, so now that you've thought through your change, another, another document that you'll have is a uh, Steps to Effective Change Worksheet, and I hope that that will be helpful for you. That will work through some of these non-negotiable factors and some of the issues that we've talked about. I use that when I'm about to make a change, and I work through that worksheet, and it helps me think through all of these elements. I hope that'll be a blessing to your ministry leadership. As we close out, let me just uh, take note of some closing items, issues. You want to work on alignment. And alignment in a change means that you think through the individuals and then the groups and then the larger whole of who will uh, have to work in the midst of that change. So let's take the parents need a new check-in system issue. Your individuals are going to be your ones who have the, the ultimate one-on-one -on -one buy-in to that process. They're the ones who are greeting the parents each week or they are the ones who have been the most vocal voices that they don't like the process that you have. Those are the individuals you need to work with. Then you move along to aligning the next um, group and that group would be your leaders, uh, your ministry leaders and volunteers who have to help communicate that. And then the whole would be the parents and the any other volunteers that maybe are extant, sort of on the outside that still have some buy-in to that. You want to work through individuals, groups, and then larger uh, corporate groups in terms of aligning that change. Change often goes hand in hand with conflict. Just get ready. There will be the naysayers. There will be people who don't want to do what you're doing. They don't like the way that you're doing it. There's going to be conflict, and so be prepared for that. Uh, read up a little bit on how to handle conflict, how to work with people. I'd recommend a great book called The Peacemaker, and it's by a guy named Ken Sandy. Uh, that really helps a lot with, with conflict. and Change uh, via outrage is another thing to consider. Sometimes we need to change things just because it's got to happen, and it's got to happen fast. It could be a theological change. It could be that you have seen a, a sweep of, of philosophy or theological idea that is running through your ministry or in your teaching, and it, it could be a hurtful thing, and that's got to happen quickly. Uh, you might have a safety problem, and you've realized that a gap has, has come or, or something has been broken in the safety procedures, and you've got to change that quickly, and it's just got to happen because you're outraged about it. Not that you're angry, but that it's just a shock. It just shouldn't be happening that way. So uh, think through that. Sometimes you don't have a year to plan through a change, but you can still work through some of these steps in a matter of a day or two. Some of these things have to be changed very quickly. I would definitely always have the pastor and appropriate decision makers on your side. The pastor especially, you want him to be a voice of support for you and you want him to be as much in the communication loop as you are. And then there also might be a process of decision making at your church, whether it's a deacon board, whether it's a group of elders, overseers, whether it's a ministry team that you work with. And I would always ensure that those people are on your side so that they can be a good voice for you. And then the final thing, you need to expect some difficulties and setbacks. And in fact, as you're planning and calendaring through your change, I would most definitely build in some buffer and margin because there's going to be some setbacks. There's going to be things that aren't going to happen on your timing. There's going to be some challenges and difficulties, and you will be well served if you will prepare for those things. And so that wraps up change. I have enjoyed being with you today. I want to uh, point you to my new website. It is called Becoming Saturated. The website address is becomingsaturated.com. And I have been really convicted of the Lord after I started doing my free CM stuff website that I needed to really celebrate the supremacy of Christ in my life, in my ministry. You know, Colossians 1.18, it says that he himself might come to have supremacy in everything. Jesus desires to be first place in everything. And so becoming saturated is an effort for me to further the dialogue about the supremacy of Christ, Christ being supreme in our life, in our walk as disciples, Christ being supreme in our families, in our marriages, in our relationships with our children, Christ being supreme in our ministry. And then I also have a deep passion 
to see how that Colossians 1.18 mentality, Christ being supreme, how that connects with the idea of Psalm 78 and building a legacy. If we're building a legacy and this whole talk of family ministry is really bubbling up right now, we need to build a legacy that is focused on the centrality of Jesus Christ. And so I hope that I can present some thoughtful, some theological, some practical articles on Becoming Saturated that will help benefit your ministry. I'd love for you to check it out and spread the word on that if you could. I've enjoyed being with you. You can purchase this video at um, the uh, Children's Ministry Web Summit uh, website and uh, keep it for future or pass it along to other leaders that you find. And, and you can also do that with all the other great videos that you're seeing during this um, conference. So I hope you have a blessed ministry and I hope your changes go.